All right, thank you. Uh, so in addition to talking about transactions, I'm going to give a broad overview of what we're doing at Logic Blocks. <coughs> so some of the big themes I'll be hitting today are that everything is easier with functional programming, uh, functional data structures. Um, declarative languages and optimal algorithms are a potent combination. And that programming languages have a lot to contribute to the field of databases and vice versa. Um, we have at Logic Blocks three main areas of focus, which is programming languages, databases, and machine learning. And we're constantly hitting up against interesting problems because of the creative friction that comes from these three areas intersecting. So one of the goals of Logic Blocks is to cut through what we call the enterprise hairball. So this is a bird's eye view of a typical large organization's data systems. So in this case, you have 12 different programming languages and uh, nine or more different tech stacks and tons of glue to make these all talk to each other and exchange data. So as you can imagine, this involves a lot of uh, overhead and pain for enterprises. So what we'd like to do is to consolidate all of these kinds of systems into one uh, programming platform. So this requires that we invent a whole new approach to data intensive programming. One of our inspirations for this is what's happened with a smartphone. So if you look back to the 1980s, we used to have tons of different cool devices like VCRs and ghetto blasters and so on, Walkman, to do all these different functionalities. And nowadays you just have the one tiny smartphone that is so much more powerful. And so our question is, can we achieve for software what the smartphone has achieved for all of these uh, uh, 90s devices, 80s devices? And so we think the answer is yes, but it really requires that we develop a new approach to data-intensive programming. So some of our key ingredients for achieving this are declarative and subrecursive languages, functional data structures, incremental computation. Uh, in some sense, 90% of what we do is incremental computation. Optimal algorithms and using new modern uh, algorithms and page data structures. We have a team that has three areas of expertise, uh, PL, software engineering, uh, databases, and machine learning and operations research. Most of these people have been recruited from academia. So we have uh, 31 PhDs, eight full-time former profs, and five part-time profs with the company. Uh, our interesting problems come from the intersection of th those three domains. So to give you a taste for the kind of problems, so my mic was cut out. Uh, do you want to fix it or should I keep going? It's good? Okay, it's just level. Okay. All right. Um, so to give you a taste for uh, what happens at the intersection of these three things. So as in databases, we have large quantities of data. Like in programming languages, you're writing programs to process that data. And in a typical machine learning operations research uh, applications, we're solving problems, making inferences, and so on. But all of these things are happening at the same time and uh, working together. So the user program specifies the results to be computed from the data. So we have summary statistics. We might be making business decisions automatically, uh, and uh, analyzing what we're doing for regulatory compliance, uh, coming up with new strategies and plans. And this may involve a mixture of uh, kind of historical traditional database logic, but also machine learning and optimization. As this is going on, users are actively and concurrently modifying the data in the database. And so we somehow need to keep all of these business decisions and statistics up to date quickly as data is being modified. And to add another wrinkle, uh, users are actively modifying the program that's being evaluated. So you can think of it a as a program where your input data and the program itself are constantly changing and you need to keep up as quickly as possible. Uh, so this has led to many new challenges and interesting problems for us. So I'll give now a brief overview of our logical language, which is the language in which users develop applications. So you can think of logical as uh, related to data log, as Haskell is to the Lambda calculus. So data log was a popular logic language among academics in the past, and it's currently experiencing a resurgence in popularity. So logical takes data log as a core uh, language and adds to it lots of interesting features like aggregation, constructive, delta logic, machine learning, and so on. Uh, we're not alone in using data log as the center for what we're, do we're doing. So these are some other companies, Datomic, VMware, Google Research, SEML-E, which are also working on database, uh, uh, data log-based solutions. 
So the, the basic piece of data in our system is a predicate, which can be either a relation or a function. So we use round brackets for relations and square brackets for functions. And collectively, we refer to these as predicates. We distinguish between two kinds of predicates. So E to B predicates, you can think of as the inputs to your program. There are things that you can run a transaction and modify them and then see what comes out as the output. Uh, IDB, or intentional database, these are predicates that are computed by the program. Some of them reflect internal state for computations, and others are uh, outputs that we would eventually present to users. Here's a tiny example of a, a logical computation. So at the top here, we've got a parent relation being declared. So person here is a, what we call an entity type. So uh, X is a parent of Y is the relation we're defining. From that, we can write a rule that says, if X is the parent of Z and Z is the parent of Y, then you can infer that X is the grandparent of Y. And similarly, you can define siblings and cousins and so on. So the idea is that in our system, this logic is installed. And every time you add a new parent relationship, all of this is automatically and quickly uh, kept up to date. Uh, you can think of the core of logical as being first-order logic with some minor extensions. So when users write code like this, internally we uh, do type inference and quantifier placement and turn it into something that looks very much like first-order logic with explicit quantifiers and types. The uh, language also supports recursion. So if you write a, a set of rules that has a cyclic dependence in it, then this is identified as a fixed point computation and automatically run to completion. So uh, in order to evaluate all of these rules and incrementally maintain them, we work with what is called an execution graph. You can just think of this as a dependence graph. So we have vertices, which are rules and predicates. So if a rule derives into a predicate P, we put an edge. If it produces as an output uh, predicate P, then we put an edge and so on. So for our simple uh, parent ancestor example, this would be the execution graph. For example, we had a rule defining, oh, I didn't have a pointer. We have a rule defining a uh, grandparent up here. And you can see there's an input above, which is the parent relation, and it's outputting grandparent. And here we have a box indicating a recursive fixed point. So you have a back edge here, which makes it cyclic. OK, so this is obviously a toy example. Um, we actually work on much bigger uh, systems in practice. So this is a real-world execution graph. So uh, one of the fellows in our group was trying to debug this application, and they thought it would be helpful to have a dot visualization of the execution graph, which is something we routinely do. Uh, but we, we've never actually done it on one of these huge applications. And it ran for many, many hours, and eventually produced an output that was 351 meters long by 48 meters tall. And you have 15,000 rules, 100,000 predicates, and seven fixed points in this. So it's kind of an open problem. How can we actually navigate and debug in this, in this kind of setting when you have such massive uh, execution graphs? So we use the execution graph for three primary purposes. In full evaluation, we use it to uh, respect dependency orders. In incremental maintenance, you can think of this as rippling uh, changes through the execution graph. And we use it also for task parallelism. So any anti-chain of rules can be run concurrently without conflict. Our language also has constructors, which you can think of as algebraic data types with memoization. So here I've got a new constructor, uh, person by name. So I can create a new person by giving them a name. It'll automatically give me a person identifier out of this. And currently, you have to say lang colon constructor person by name, which is quite clunky. But we're adding a keyword shortly. Uh, and this is sufficiently powerful that we've toyed with translating a small fragment of ML into this. We also have delta logic, which is used to modify EDP predicates and transactions. So uh, you can think of these as similar to event condition action rules or triggers in traditional databases. So the syntax sugar that we use is just to put a plus or minus in front of it. So plus foo means something is being inserted, and minus foo means that something is being removed. So for example, if we want to add two new people to our little database, uh, Kim and Glenn, we can write a rule that says, uh, add these to the person by name constructor and also to the person entity type. And uh, here we're adding a parent relation for these 
two, 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 two. Okay, so this is purely syntactic sugar, and underneath the hood, it desugar is too core logical. So it's actually purely functional. Uh, the plus minus is uh, simply sugar. So our our system processes transactions is is what it basically does, and so transactions can have four different parts in them. The first part you can optionally add or remove IDB rules, so you're modifying the program that's installed. Uh, the second part is to have delta logic that is going to modify those input uh, predicates for your computations. The system then incrementally maintains all the computations you have installed, and optionally you can do a query then on the uh, modified state that's been updated. So one of the, the challenges that we had is that internally, when someone adds a new rule to the database, there's tons of things that have to change in our internal uh, metadata just like modifying the execution graph, figuring out does that introduce a new fixed point when you add this rule, and so on and so on. So we actually have a whole other uh, data flow interpreter just for handling meta level operations. So when you add a new rule, we actually run an interpreted program that figures out how we have to modify all of our metadata uh, to, to incorporate that. All right, so that's just a taste for what the language is like. Uh, there are many more interesting topics like modules, layers, fly programming, machine learning, uh, we, we handle optimization problems directly in the language. So you can write something that uh, looks like there exists a coloring for this graph. And what you're really saying is there exists a coloring for the graph and you're going to find it for me. Uh, we also are working on probabilistic programming and lots of other interesting problems. <coughs> All right, so a few example applications to give you a taste for what we're doing. Uh, one of our clients is a tier one global bank and they're trying to comply with new regulations that were introduced after the financial crisis. So the uh, specification requires that it import 18 to 25 million transactions per day. And these are continuously being imported in batches every few seconds. Uh, in order to process these, there are 500 rules that slurp the data into the system and about 1,200 rules that compute all of the summary statistics need for needed for regulatory compliance. So uh, in near real time, they can track how much money they have, uh, lots of statistics about uh, financial stuff I don't understand and, and make sure that they're uh, in compliance with the regulations. Another example, retail is one of our big areas. So we work with, uh, I think, three of the top 10 retailers in North America. Um, so this particular one, uh, they are optimizing their inventory <coughs> flow through supply chain networks. So you have vendors, distribution centers, and stores, and you want to figure out uh, what's the projected demand for, say, light bulbs in a certain location next Thursday. How are we going to place orders for different things from our vendors? When should we ship them in order to minimize costs and so on? So this is a massive optimization problem. Uh, you have 100,000 different unique SKUs, like light bulbs, hammers, and so on. 1,000 stores and 100 time periods that you're projecting forward into. So we have 10, 10 billion variables that we're optimizing for. So this particular client, every night, they uh, launch a new computation which has the up to the you know, up to that day's data, <laughs> sales data, and they redo all of their forecasts for demand, redo all of their inventory computations, and so on and so on. So we uh, provision this with hundreds of dynamically provisioned cloud machines, and run this massive computation, and then uh, produce the output, which is their plan for all their inventory movement for the next period. Uh, another example is our modeler framework. So this is a web-based application, and the typical scenario is that you have, say, 100 people who are doing planning for a large retailer, uh, trying to figure out what should we put be putting on sale, what in new inventory we're going to introduce, and so on. Uh, and they're all doing analysis and updating data, and at the same time, the system is slurping in uh, new sales data in order to update forecasts and so on. So this one is different from the previous two in that it's actually uh, modifying program code. So all of these people have an environment where they're doing kind of Excel on, on steroids, and they can add new rules through this, through this GUI. Okay, so how are we actually getting this done? So one of our basic building blocks is purely functional data structures. So languages like Haskell forbid destructive updates, uh, which are one of the basic operations you need for traditional data structures like trees and queues. So you need quite different data structures in order to cope with the constraints of immutability and still be efficient. But in hindsight, they turn out to be very powerful in many other settings. And one of the 
uses that we are extremely fond of is concurrency in databases. So one of the, the basic operations that we use with purely functional data structures is copy on write. So this search tree on the left here, we're going to insert a new uh, value E to it. To do that, we find the spot in the tree where E would go, and we uh, make a new E, and then duplicate the path up to the root, and we have a pointer to a new version of the tree. So these two versions can exist at the same time and also share uh, storage space. <coughs> and one of the nice effects of this is that we get multi-versioning for free, obviously. And in practice, we have many, many different versions of all of our data uh, floating around simultaneously. <coughs> all right, so uh, purely functional data structures let us do lots of really nice things. So the most important one is that you no longer need locks. So when you want to do a transaction that's uh, independent from other people, <coughs> you can just branch the database, which is a constant time operation, perform all of your updates uh, on your copy of the database, uh, and then commit. So we actually go to great lengths to avoid mutexes and atomic memory ops, because these are scalability hazards. Uh, another benefit is that data shared between threads is always immutable. So if you have mutable data, it's always local to your own thread. So at a hardware level, this means that the uh, cache coherence protocols going on between cores have a much lower workload. So it reduces cache line bouncing and things like that. And in the distributed setting, it means that you don't need any kind of cache coherence protocol at that level. So if you have an identifier for an object, it uniquely identifies the state of the object. So the whole cache coherence problem disappears. We also get nice features like time travel and uh, mercurial git style branching, more or less for free. And in practice, we use this uh, feature extensively. So in, in that modeler application that I was showing you, we typically have many different branches of the database on the, on the go at the same time. Uh, another nice benefit is that you don't need a transaction log or recovery protocol. <coughs> so when you trans do a transaction commit, conceptually, you're just taking the pointer to the, the main database and you're just moving it to a new version. So uh, it's a very simple operation, and if a transaction is aborted, say, because of an exception throw, then everything is just garbage collected and it disappears. There's no need to go through and reverse all of the effects of the transaction up until that point. <coughs> so we spend a lot of time doing incremental computation, and because of this emphasis, it's really important that we be able to diff two versions of a predicate quickly. So functional data structures are ideal for this because you can navigate simultaneously through two versions of the tree, and any time you get to a shared substructure, you just skip it because they're obviously the same. So typically you can uh, traverse the diffs in time that's proportional to the size of the diff log, the number of things that are stored in it. Now, uh, these purely functional data structures come with some challenges as well. So one of them is garbage collection. So complex garbage collection is the price that you have to pay for not using locks and cache coherence. So in some sense, there's no free lunch. And if you're going to dodge locks and cache coherence, uh, you're going to have to pay for it with complicated garbage collection. So in practice, we have quite intricate engineering that goes into doing this for our page data structures. Uh, we have an asynchronous distributed garbage collector that, that is specialized for these copy on write page data structures. Another challenging uh, aspect is obviously concurrent writes. If you've got multiple users who want to modify data at the same time, uh, sure, they can each branch the data structure and modify it, but then at some point you have to bring all this together and produce a result. So towards the end of the, the talk, I'll, I'll cycl circle back to this and talk about transaction repair. <coughs> uh, another challenge is that page data structures and copy on write is quite expensive. If, for example, you're doing scattered updates into a large B tree, uh, it's quite expensive to copy each individual page that's being modified and all of the index pages and so on. So the solution to this is to use modern data structures that are called write-optimized data structures. And typically these data structures consolidate recent changes near the root of the tree. And then these changes spill down into lower levels of the tree as needed. So this uh, results in a vast reduction in the number of pages that you dirty. And also it's much faster for, for diffing between versions using these trees. So what we found is that in order to make this efficient, both for metadata manipulation and for large page data structures, 
is that we need to relax the model and not use pure, pure functional data structures, but what we call mutable until shared. So mutable until shared <coughs> is a, a discipline where thread local data can be mutable up until the point where it is communicated with another thread. Uh, you can also at any time branch the object at which point it com becomes immutable. So if you allocate a new object, say a tree, you're free to modify it with destructive updates until the point where it's communicated to another thread, committed to the database, and so on. And at that point, uh, it's, uh, you know, we sweep through it and mark everything as immutable, and you're no longer allowed to modify it. But if you want to modify the, the, the data structure, all you have to do is branch it, and make your changes, and then communicate the new results and so on. So in, in practice, we find found this is a very efficient approach to uh, achieving the benefit. Um, so when we branch them, we would just copy the root node. Yeah. And then we do copy on write from that point. Okay, so logical, our, our programming language is declarative. And I'd like to talk a bit about the benefits and, and drawbacks of this approach. So it's simpler for users. Uh, in a declarative language, they can simply specify their problem, not the implementation. And on for us, on the developer side, it makes many aspects of the runtime easier. So program analysis is obviously much, much simpler. We just have basically a, a big mess of first order logic, and we can dump it into Z3, improve properties, and so on. So that aspect is very nice. Uh, the the um, declarative aspects make, make it much easier to do task and data parallelism. And you don't have to worry about reasoning about effects and, and all the nastiness of that. And it also makes incremental computation a lot easier. There are some drawbacks to using declarative languages. So obviously the good side is that it's simpler for users to declare what, what their problem is, to specify their problem. But the bad side is, is that they can't specify how to implement it, if they happen to know a, uh, an efficient way to I implement it. So they're at the mercy of the runtime. It's up to us to choose an efficient implementation. Uh, and this is a big challenge because program synthesis is a notorious performance bog. So, for example, if you want to correctly take a s uh, specification and synthesize a p-time program from it, in order to do that, you're effectively having to prove that that specification specifies a p-time computation. So your, your, uh, the amount of work you do and the complexity of this, it's, it's an undecidable problem. <coughs> so... Um, So uh, another aspect of our approach is that our programming language is subrecursive, so it's not Turing complete. Um, you have a limited language that captures p time, so first order logic with the fixed points. It's a classic result from descriptive complexity that this is p time. And one of the nice benefits of this is that users can't write non-terminating programs. So you can imagine if you're in a transaction system, it's nice to know that things are eventually going to stop, and you can say the transaction is done. Uh, another advantage is that the aesthetic of the language encourages users to break down their problems into small thoughts. You need to formulate your problem as lots of, of little rules. And because of that, we can uh, deal with those little rules quite efficiently. Uh, one of the most important aspects of using a subrecursive language is that the onus of proof uh, is shifted from the, the program synthesis side to the user side. So when the user writes the program in data log, they're implicitly providing a proof that their specification is in P time. So all of the nasty aspects of that for us disappear. And in practice, it's uh, many of our applications are sufficiently simple that this is, this is not a big deal. And for me, the, the biggest point is that for many interesting fragments of data log, we can achieve optimal implementation. So uh, a lot of, of what our theoretical focus is, is finding optimal algorithms for things. So if you take it to declarative language, you have the problem that users can't specify implementation choices. But if you can, comp if you can pair a declarative language with provably optimal algorithms, then you have a really winning combination. So here are some examples of uh, optimal algorithms in logic blocks. So leapfrog tree join is a join processing algorithm that achieves worst case optimal runtime. So the runtime of it 
is uh, O tilde of max input to the power of beta, where beta is a uh, fractional hypergraph edge cover number. And these are things that I can't really explain in the scope of this talk, but um, there's, there's interesting uh, papers behind these. Another example is inside out. So this is uh, uh, an approach to handling complex queries where we perform a set of theoretically optimal rewrites to turn it into a set of rules which we then evaluate with leapfrog tree join. So this one has running time of uh, input to the power of fractional hyper tree width plus output, and this is provably optimal. Uh, we also have a query optimizer that uses a strategy that has cost at most one plus epsilon opt, where opt is the minimal cost estimate of any strategy. And for incremental computation, we maintain our rules in time proportional to the trace edit distance. So if you think of uh, running your computation on one input, you're going to change the input, completely rerun the computation here, you get two different traces of the computation. And you have a set of edits that you can do to transform your first trace into your second trace. So we achieve something that's big O tilde of that trace edit distance in order to do the incremental maintenance. All right. So there's a dark side of subrecursive languages as well. So succinctness is sometimes a problem. So there are p-time problems that are awkward to express naturally in data log. Uh, just as an example, um, for uh, okay, that, that's misplaced. Just ignore that. <laughs> um, however, uh, there's some natural remedies, and, and we make use of these. So when you hit a problem that is in p-time but is awkward to express in data log, you can take an excursion into a more powerful fragment, so you can dip out into p space or np, and we have language subsets that capture these. And so typically, 99% of the time, you're writing in core data log, which is p time, but then you hit that one thing that's really awkward, and you dip out into one of these stronger, stronger fragments. We also implement language ex extensions to make common patterns less awkward. So for example, lots of our applications deal with total functions of default values, if you have a, a large cost product P space of, say, items, uh, the cell, store locations, time, you imagine the cost product of this is a vast space, but there are lots of zeros in it. So we, uh, we, we natively support total functions with default values. Um, the third strategy we can use is to carve out larger fragments of data log that are provably P time and make those available. So for example, allowing more restricted forms of recursion through aggregation. Okay, uh, another key ingredient is our join algorithms, which uh, enable a lot of the, the interesting things that we can do in terms of theoretical results and also practical results. So classical join processing, uh, as an example, at the top we've got a rule that's joining predicates A, B, and C, and the textbook approach would involve constructing a tree of algebraic operators. So we might join uh, C with D and get an intermediate result. Um, we would take A, join that with the result, do a projection, join that with B, and this would give us our result. Okay, so our approach is quite different. So the last decade or so, there's been a new wave of join algorithms being developed. Uh, many of these people are at logic block. <coughs> so a, a brief history. So most of this started with the 2008 paper that proved a tight bound on the result size of a query given constraints on the input sizes. So then the obvious question was, can you implement algorithms that achieve this running time? So have a running time that's proportional to the actual query result size. So this was achieved in 2012. Um, and this won best paper at pods. And Hung Ngo is now at Logic Blocks. Uh, independently from that work at Logic Blocks, we developed this leapfrog tree join. And we were able to prove that it also achieves this worst case optimality and, and a, a slightly stronger optimality result, actually. <coughs> uh, and since then, there's been an a increasingly stronger line of join algorithms. Uh, and these ones here uh, that are asterisks, these are ones that we actually implement. And if you're using our system, this is what's going on under the hood. Uh, the names in bold are people who are at logic blocks. OK, so our core join algorithm uh, that we use for Okay, do you want me to pause or keep going?
Nine volts or around? I don't know how this thing opens. First of all. this with the tree joint aspect, it becomes more interesting. The other one might be empty, so... Uh, okay. Alrighty. Looks like this is the video recording. Okay. <coughs> Alright, so when we go from unary joins to more complicated tree joins, we use a tree presentation or tri presentation of the relations. So on the left here, I've got uh, a set of records for some ternary relation A. And the tri representation of this, we just have a tree where each path to the tree is a tuple. So here we've got a record 135, and there's a corresponding path in the tri 135. So this is just an abstraction. We don't actually store the data in a tri representation. It's purely uh, an interface that we put on top of our page data structure. So the way that the leapfrog tree joint works, you can think of it as a backtracking search, where at each uh, step of the search, you're performing a leapfrog join. So we would choose an order in which we're going to bind our T's, say X, Y, Z. We would do a, a leapfrog to find uh, values of X that are in both A and B in that intersection. When we find those, we go onto the Y's and do a leapfrog join there to find uh, Y's that are in the intersection. When we find one of those, we go to the Z's and so on. Then when we run out of things at the bottom level, we backtrack the uh, recursive backtracking search for those leapfrog joins. So it's a very simple algorithm, but it turns out to have a lovely theoretical property, which is that it achieves this worst case optimality result. And No, we, we work with other core. Um, yeah, so the, the gist of this is that if you have a, a query and you have restrictions on, say, sizes of the predicates, sizes of the projections of the predicates, and so on, the running time of this algorithm will be at most uh, the running time, sorry, at most the output size of the worst database you can devise that satisfies those cardinality constraints. So in practice, it does very well on, on complex queries, for example, graph queries. So this is an example benchmark result of a graph database. The x-axis here is the, the size of the graph. The y-axis is the running time for 14 queries. Uh, the blue and green lines are uh, specialized graph databases for doing these kinds of computations. And the red line is the performance of the leapfrog tree join. So you can see that it's uh, it, it looks asymptotically faster than these other databases. Okay, another big building block for us is incremental computation. So we have an installed program, and when some input data changes, we want to update all of our internal computations uh, to adjust for this. So the, the simple cases like siblings, parents, cousins, these are quite simple to evaluate incrementally. Uh, more challenging cases are things like this. So I'm starting with a new and looking it up in a function a and getting result b. I apply function b to that and get a w, apply function c and get an x, so and so on. And now I have a result that someone has changed an e here. And somehow I have to know what values of u could be affected by me changing this last function in the chain here. So it's obviously a, a tricky problem. So 
question is, how well can we hope to perform when maintaining rules like this? So our answer th to this is the, the trace edit system. So you can think of a diagram like this, uh, a leapfrog join, as being a trace of the join computation. So it's a set of low-level steps that were performed when performing the join. So for this uh, uh, join that involves these function lookups, you can imagine that transaction updates each one of these uh, functions A, B, C, D, E. And we want to somehow update the result in the head. So conceptually, you can think about running leapfrog tree join on these two database instances separately. First, we run it on the original predicate. Then we run it on the modified predicate. This gives you two traces. And the trace edit distance is how many changes you make to that leapfrog tree join uh, diagram in order to transform it into the, the second version. So we're able to achieve incremental computation that has cost proportional to this trace edit distance. So you can also think that this is itself an optimal join algorithm. You're maintaining like incrementally in something that uh, yeah, has a kind of nice optimality property. Um, we can't actually prove that this is optimal, but so far it's the best we've come up with. So the way we achieve this is with uh, two parts, sensitivity indices and change oracles. So sensitivity indices are a bit complicated, and I think I'll, I'll leave them for uh, interested people to follow up on. And there's a paper about this you can read. But the basic idea is that as you perform the join, uh, if you're way down in, say, a series of function lookups, each time you access that predicate, you're keeping track of how you accessed it and what the path was through that tree uh, of variables to get you to that point. So then when the data is modified, you can uh, query the sensitivity index and figure out what parts of your join have to be revisited and revised. So the second part is this change oracle. So those sensitive indi indices are stored in special page data structures that allow us to uh, efficiently query where we're matching intervals, uh, where a change in our input data requires us to revisit the data. <coughs> yeah. so, uh, so given the sensitive indices changes to the input data, we uh, query them against each other, and this gives us a set of places in the join where we have to revisit. Okay, finally I'll talk about uh, transaction repair, which is how we're planning to put these uh, components that I've talked about so far together to achieve scalable uh, transaction costs. <coughs> All right, so uh, the fact that we're using purely functional data structures is great for read-only transactions because we're infinitely scalable in a theoretical sense. And in practice, we scale extremely well. Uh, it's a more challenging when we have n simultaneous writers, because they can't modify the data at the same time. So what we do is we allow all of the transactions to proceed independently in parallel, each one with their own branch of the database. Uh, and this gives us you know, n different versions of the database and changes. And what we want to then do is merge all of these results together and uh, repair any conflicts that occurred because of uh, read after write and so on. And we do this using our uh, fast incremental maintenance algorithms. So the basic philosophy is that we don't lock, instead we repair afterwards. So it's better to ask forgiveness than beg permission. The semantics that we're providing with this uh, mechanism are fully serializable. So the effect you get is the same as if you ran the transactions one by one. So we're really bucking the trend here. Everyone else is giving up on ACID. Most major databases don't even turn on ACID by default because it just doesn't scale. Uh, we think that serializable ACID transactions will be a big advantage because it's vastly simpler for developers. Uh, the developer doesn't have to worry about anything to do with concurrency. They can just assume that there's one CPU that's performing all of the transactions and the result they get is the same as if um, they just done the transactions one at a time. So no more eventually consistency artifacts or anything. Um, so the theory of this scales beautifully. We have a prototype uh, that's producing very promising results, and the full implementation is in the works. So let me give you a taste for how it operates. So you can think of a single transaction as a black box. The transaction takes as an input the initial database state. 
and it's going to produce some changes to the database state, which we call delta. So suppose we want to run two transactions at the same time. We can just uh, branch the database, run each transaction in its own thread, and each one will produce its changes. And then we could just combine those changes. But what if the first transaction modified some data that's read by the second transaction? So what we can do is use our incremental maintenance algorithms for this. Uh, within the transaction, we have an execution graph. Each rule in that graph is being evaluated with a Greek log tree join. From that, we can get sensitivity indices. We can aggregate those sensitivities to produce sensitivities for the transaction as a whole. So we have a summary of all the data that uh, was either read by the transaction or was attempted to be read by the transaction. So we provide sensitivities for the second transaction. And what we then want to do is match those sensitivities against the changes from the first transaction. So we have this little uh, repair circuit box here, which takes changes from the first transaction, the sensitivities from the second transaction, intersects them, and forwards on those changes that are relevant to this transaction. And for this transaction, we just use uh, the same algorithms that we use for uh, doing an incremental computation for regular transactions in order to maintain the transaction. And then we produce updated deltas coming up. So with this in place, we can then merge the deltas that uh, result from these two transactions, giving priority to those later in time. So later in time is farther down on the slide here. If we have more transactions that occurred earlier in time than these transactions, then we can collect sensitivities from both of these transactions, merge them together, and then send these back to the earlier transact. Yeah, use these to uh, uh, filter out the changes made by earlier transactions, and then forward them then uh, then in here to repair these transactions. So this is what the the correction filters look like for two transactions. We have the uh, changes from the earlier transactions coming in being matched with the sensitivities of the two transactions combined. And then these changes are forwarded down to the individual transactions. All right, so if I draw a box around this group of two transactions and ignore what's inside, you can see that it looks just like a single transaction. You've got initial database com state coming in. Uh, you've got sensitivities and deltas going out and corrections coming in. So we can use this as a building block to handle larger and larger batches of transactions. So this is what the tree looks like for four transactions. And you can obviously scale this, this up fairly high. And the, the depth of your circuit is going to be logarithmic in the number of transactions. Okay. So here's a, a tree for eight. <coughs> All right, now suppose we have an actual conflict. We've, we've got each transaction reading and modifying data in the database. And three of these transactions have uh, read after write conflicts. So these are the ones I've shaded in in pink here. How this is going to work is that the first transaction is going to produce uh, its deltas. And when these deltas are propagated down to the point where they're intersected with the sensitivity from this group of transactions, they'll be propagated through because they, they pass the sensitivity check. Uh, same here. And then we'll do incremental maintenance on this transaction. The changes from that transaction will then get rippled out here. They'll pass the sensitivity delta check and get forwarded down to this transaction. And we'll incremental maintain the state of that transaction. And then finally, we end up with a database state that's consistent. So all this occurs in parallel. And the, this is actually defined by the fixed point iteration. And the running time is related to the length of the largest conflict term uh, in these transactions. So if every transaction is independent, no read-write conflicts, then the running time is just logarithmic in the number of transactions. If everyone's uh, incrementing the same counter, uh, then you end up with a linear in the number of transactions. And but in practice, yeah, in our kinds of systems, uh, if you design them right, you can count on having sparse uh, conflict patterns between transactions. So this scales very well. You can also apply this pattern to multiple machines. Um, so. Yeah, you can have multiple machines simultaneously uh, processing transactions, sending sensitivities and deltas to each other. Okay, uh, 
quick, quick example result. So this is a scenario where lots of transactions have conflicts with each other. And the parameter here is saying uh, how many conflicts there are. So the blue line is no conflict, lots of conflicts. In the traditional approach, low level locking. The transaction repair, we get scalability and all of these. Okay, so uh, to summarize, Logical is a database uh, platform programming language for data intensive applications. It has a similar relation to DataDog as Haslab as Lambda Calculus. So we're very big on uh, correctness and foundations. Uh, purely, data purely, purely functional data structures are awesome and allow us to do lots of nice stuff performance wise for concurrency. And finally, declarative languages and optimal algorithms are a really potent combination. Okay, thank you.